Yeah, angular momentum. Uh, which part about angular momentum? Mm. Yeah, so um, let me bring out my demo for that. So you remember the bicycle wheel, right? So there's uh, different levels at which this question can be asked. And angular momentum is a topic that will probably occur on the exam. So it's uh, uh, worthwhile making sure you are familiar. <coughs> now, the one example you have seen dealing with precession, that's the level at which it's the most difficult. Because with the precession, that's where you have to bring in cross product. You have to think of angular momentum as uh, not just uh, counterclockwise or clockwise rotation, but as a vector that's uh, using the right hand rule, as a vector that's pointing towards you. And you know, it's a very abstract way of thinking, and it's not easy. <laughs> um, that's why I want to bring this other level that I think actually everyone can get. Because in this particular case, we can say this. Instead of trying to think of angular momentum in three dimensions, you can say, I'm going to restrict myself to looking at rotation um, about the in the horizontal plane. So that if you see something that's rotating like this, you say, well, viewed from above, it's not rotating. Right? And you only consider the rotations that you can see as you're looking, you are looking at it from top. So what it is is uh, you are limiting your angular momentum or any other rotational quantity along the z-axis alone. Because um, anything that's rotating in the horizontal plane will have component of the cross product stuff along this axis. So I think that's something that everyone can understand because then you are limiting yourself to one plane, you are limiting yourself from one point of view and say from that point of view, it's clockwise or counterclockwise. And this is a demo you have seen where uh, right now, viewed from above, nothing is rotating. And even when I do this, viewed from above, nothing is still rotating because this is not rotating in the horizontal plane. So what you can now say is that angular momentum of the combined system is zero as viewed from top, or the component along the x-axis is zero. So when I flip this around so that viewed from top, the wheel spins clockwise, then this is where I use conservation of angular momentum to say, oh, the net angular momentum between the, uh, together with the wheel and me should be zero. Wheel is spinning clockwise. That's why I'm spinning counterclockwise, right? Oh, at least until the friction kicks in enough so that it doesn't, uh, all right, let me try to stop myself here. Um, so you can, Understand that in terms of conservation of angular momentum. And you know, if you want to go a little bit more into it, why angular momentum along the z-axis is conserved, well, I'm on this rotating platform, so there's no external torque on me that's along the horizontal plane. Any torque on me would be um, not around the z-axis, but around the x or y-axis. As in, like, if I try to do cartwheel like this, then I'm applying a, a torque along the, this, around the this axis. Does this address your question about angular momentum? Um, the other thing about angular momentum that is challenging is remembering all the different relationships. Um, this, in fact, this is the biggest challenge with rotational quantities. And, yeah, I mean, it's actually the biggest challenge with physics. Um, so it goes with what I was saying about how, how you approach physics is different from how you have approached other science classes. Like when you are taking chemistry and when you are doing gas laws, you had to know ideal gas law and that was it. There was really nothing else you had to know. A lot of the questions that you might be asked are essentially application of ideal gas law. When you do thermodynamics in physics, it'll be a little bit challenging because using ideal gas law is only a first step. You have to know a bunch of other stuff to work out whatever question we are asking. 
the requirement is in physics is that you don't know quite as many wide range of topics as you might in um, other subjects. Like you know, if you take human anatomy, you're going to know a lot more about human bones than I ever know. Um, but that narrower range of topics you know in physics comes with a level of focus. That those narrow range of things you know, you know, know them very, very well. So uh, a lot of people, when you study something, you find out something, and then you think to yourself, oh, that's enough to know. I, now I move on. And that's not right way to study physics. That's why we, um, we, em we, that's why we emphas emphasize uh, problem solving, because it's when you're pro solving problems that you realize, oh, I need to know all these other relationships also to solve this problem. So with the angular momentum, these are all the formulas involving angular momentum that you should know. And you should know like which one to use when. So let me write them all down uh, so that you see all of them in one place. So let me start out with uh, the version of angular momentum that's uh, the definition of angular momentum. Or at least, yeah, it, it's the way it's most fundamentally defined. So angular momentum is uh, defined in terms of the translational quantities, momentum and uh, displacement. It's a displacement cross product with momentum. That is the definition of angular momentum. It's uh, the definition of angular momentum you can apply when, um, like if this is my axis, and if I have a point mass that's moving across at constant speed, this actually has angular momentum about this point. In some sense, this is rotating about this point. It's kind of going in a, from your view, it's going in a clockwise direction, right? From clock, I mean, the radius is changing, but throughout all that, it's kind of going in a clockwise direction. And in fact, if you apply this, you'll find that as this passes through, its angular momentum is uh, constant because the lever arm doesn't change. So this is the very basic definition of angular momentum. Um, and if you are dealing with not a point mass, but an extended body like the bicycle wheel, then you would go through the procedure that we are describing. Imagine breaking this up into tiny little uh, masses and you integrate it over the whole, integrate the angular, tiny little contribution to angular momentum and add it up over the entire object and you get the total angular momentum. So a result of that can be expressed this way. Now this equation is not always true. You can find the exceptions to it, but it's true often enough. So this is the expression. Angular momentum is equal to rotational inertia. So for rigid body rotation, this is where all the hard work has already been done for you. Um, because in figuring out the rotational inertia of the object, all that integration that I was describing was already done. So that rotation inertia times the angular velocity, omega. And this is the formula that will remind you of its uh, translational analog. The translational analog of this was momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So, um, so this is another expression for angular momentum that you might use in some situations. I will warn you that the, the, this is not always true. This is true only when you are rotating about uh, something called the principal axis. This is something you can read about in the textbook. Um, I will tell you this much. I will never give you a rotation of a rigid body that's not about a principal axis because um, uh, Oh, sorry, about a, I think it's actually about an axis that's a parallel to principal axis. Whatever, I'm never going to give you a situation where this is not true. But you know, as you go on to do your job as an engineer or whatever, you should know that this has exceptions. That's when you fall back on this. Uh, like, uh, so, that this is a, so that it's just not so abstract. The exception comes with this. So if I take this wheel and rotate it about this, or if I even rotate it about like in this way, all of that's fine. But if I try to mix it up, if I try to rotate it like this about this axis, then um, this will start to develop some kind of instability um, because of the fact that this is not true anymore. So read about it in the textbook. Um, so 
We have written down two, we are not done. There's one more relationship for angular momentum that will sometimes be useful. And that's this one, the relationship between angular momentum and torque. As in, um, I guess it's easier writing it the other way. Torque is equal to rate of change of angular momentum. Or if you really want to write down angular momentum, it would be change in angular momentum is the time integral of torque from some time equals zero to some final time. Right? So this is the third relationship that involves angular momentum. And you can maybe see how this relates to this by remembering that uh, force is rate of change of momentum. So you know this type, this together with this does give you something like this. But um, so angular momentum, just a single quantity. There are three different expressions that deal with the angular momentum, and a part given particular problem will um, be easier to handle using one of these three, or you know, two of these three. But, so this is what I want to caution you against. If this is all you know about angular momentum, there will be questions that stump you. If this is all you know about angular momentum, there will be questions that stump you. <laughs> if this is all you know about angular momentum, there will be questions that stump you. In order to be able to do all the questions involving angular momentum, you have to know all three and you have to have some level of uh, familiarity on which one is more appropriate. But a good starting place is knowing that there's these three different expressions. Then you can do trial and error. You try one, if you seem stuck and not going anywhere, you try the other expression. If it doesn't work, you try the other one. But you need to know what to try. Okay? So you know, th this is an example using angular momentum, but almost all the rotational quantities can at least be expressed in two different ways. And it's uh, important to know those at least two different ways. <laughs>